There's nothing you got that I can't counter. Your karate's a joke. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a great surprise for you today. You may know him as Mike Barnes from Karate Kid 3 and the Cobra Kai series. He's an Emmy-nominated actor who's portrayed AJ Quartermain in General Hospital and Deacon Sharp in the world's most watched daytime drama, The Bold and the Beautiful. He also won an Emmy Award for Studio City, where he served as executive producer and creator, as well as receiving Emmy nominations for acting and writing. He's also an author, and his latest book, Way of the Cobra, Welcome to the Kumite, is now available at wayofthecobra.com. I'm very pleased to welcome Sean Kanan. Sean, thank you for joining us today. Ben, thank you so much for having me. It's great to talk to you again. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. And of course, me and a few friends came to see you recently at a comedy show. Uh, this was in the Valley in Los Angeles, and it was a blast. It was incredible. Uh, if I don't know, I'd love for you to talk about your experience doing stand up comedy. And I know that you might be traveling around the country doing it. But uh, I was wondering if you could give us insight into how you started with stand up comedy and what that experience is like. I remember when I was probably about 13 years old, um, my parents had gone away somewhere and uh, uh, someone was watching me and um, I managed to convince them to take me and my friend to a comedy club. And uh, we had to sort of sneak in because we wanted to get in there. And I just remember being mesmerized watching these comedians um, keep the rapt attention of the audience just with their words, you know, no script. No, no special effects, nothing, just you know, them talking. And so uh, uh, a little while later, probably about a year and a half, two years later, um, I was in Atlantic City and there was, a, there was like a talent show on the boardwalk. And I said, you know what, I'm going to get up and try and do some stand-up. And I did. And I, I really got bitten by the bug. Um, and I've been doing it off and on for years, but I've, recently I've really started picking it up. Um, I love stand-up. I mean, it's one of the true, pure American art forms, probably along with jazz. And, um, you know, so much of what I do, uh, uh, the soap opera is, you know, shot in a studio, not in front of a live audience. And films, of course, are not shot in front of a live audience. You know, you get that instant reciprocity when you're in front of a crowd and there's nothing like it. You know, what's so interesting, I thought, is that you were able to bring in all of your life experiences and some of those intersect with ours, you know, your yeah. work on Karate Kid and daytime drama. And I just thought that was so fascinating. And of course, you talked about Karate Kid 3. And I don't know, I thought it'd be interesting to ask you at this point, yeah. after all these years, and you've done so much, you know, you've won an Emmy, you are all over television, movies, uh, how do you look back on the Karate Kid Part 3? Because you brought it up a bit in your show, but how do you feel about it? How did you feel about it then when it came out? And uh, how do you look back on it now? Well, when it came out, it obviously changed not only the trajectory of my career, but the trajectory of my life um, in ways that I couldn't possibly have fathomed at the time. But as, you know, as the years expanded, it became more and more apparent what what an effect it had in so many different ways um looking back on it now well before before i look back on it you know there's also the story about how i almost lost my life while i was filming it and so people always ask me they say you know what is what's the biggest job you've ever had in your career the most important one and most people expect that it's going to be karate kid three and it is but not for the reasons that people think. I mean, you know, for me, that film will always have um, a, a very special place in my heart um, because I knew what I had to go through to get it. I know what I had to go through to finish it. And I know what the overarching effect of those experiences were in shaping me as a man. Um, looking back on it, I, you know, I was a really, really green actor. Um, now I just look back on it and think of all the things I would have liked to have done differently. And, you know, I, I would have loved to try to give the characters some more dimensions and, and colors, but this isn't an excuse, but they really wanted the guy to be like this, just intimidating sort of unidimensional thug. Come on, get up! Why are you being so stubborn? Don't do that. <laughs> And, 
you know, for me as an actor, I'm always trying to find the character's motivations. You know, bad people don't do things just because they twirl their mustache and think they're bad. You know, they've got an agenda and a reason that they're doing it. And I, I would have liked to have found the moments of, you know, gray in between the black and the white um, where we can maybe have a little bit of understanding for Mike Barnes because I don't know what if he's what if he's down here you know doing this because he needs money for an operation for his mother or you know I, I would have tried to put something in there so that when, when you can get the audience to root for a bad guy because for a minute they see a glimmer of why the bad guy's doing what they're doing I think it makes it so much more interesting so for me um, I look back, it's nostalgic, you know, it's fun to see myself, what I look like at 22 years old. Um, but, uh, you know, the acting part of me is like, wow, I really would have loved to have gotten another bite at the apple. But you know what? I did on Cobra Kai. Now, for me to do my very best, I'm going to need 50%. And, and that's one of the reasons that, you know, Cobra Kai season five will always go down as one of the most amazing work experiences I ever had for so many different reasons. But, but to be able to go back and reprise this character and not only have the redemptive arc. So one day I'm moving furniture and I meet my future father-in-law. He showed me that I could do something with these hands other than fight. But to have the other part where we see that the bad boy still lives. I say we go beat that ponytail bastard's ass tonight. Um, that was really special. And I, I'm just, I'm just, humbled and eternally grateful to the big three for bringing me back and to Ralph and to Billy and to all the fans who have really embraced Mike Barnes return. And of course, Sean, you did such an amazing job with uh, Mike Barnes. I know this is a dream come true for so many fans of Karate Kid 3 to see Mike Barnes come back. And so, you know, you had mentioned in Karate Kid 3, you didn't get that chance to kind of maybe explore the gray areas. Do you feel like in Cobra Kai season five that that character is now rounded to uh, a point that you would like? Um, do you see potential of exploring that character more? Well, I definitely see potential of exploring the character more. Um, you know, I, I can't I can't really can't really comment on that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, at the end. We, we've now seen Mike Barnes, who's pretty much lost everything, um, yet he finds himself uh, part of this unlikely quartet of, of you know, ex, ex bullies uh, that, that Daniel had to deal with, who are now sort of ersatz friends, or at least on the path to doing that by having a common enemy, um, and. Uh, yeah, I think there's a whole lot more that can be explored with the character. Circling back, I know you mentioned, and you've talked about this before, your experience on Karate Kid 3, where you did have a life-threatening injury, and that was just a very intense experience. And did that inform the character in any way? Like, when you came back to play the character, did that give you any kind of new perspective yeah. on playing the character? And are you do you bring any of that into the newer portrayal of Mike Barnes in Cobra Kai? During the time when I returned to film Karate Kid 3, I think it it absolutely had an effect on me. I, you know, I can say it now because we're decades down the road. I was treated terribly. I was treated terribly. I mean, there were no there were no flowers. There was no you know get well soon. Really, it was you've, you've got about two weeks to get back to work or we can repass it. And uh, I was angry. I was pissed off. Uh, I, I had worked so hard to get to where I was and, and, you know, very quickly realized that I was, my value was only to the extent that I could bring value to the production. Now, as an adult that's done a lot of work on himself, that is not the story that I attached to that anymore. The story that I attached to that entire series of events is that when my metal was tested, um, you know, at a very young age, I, I survived and I overcame. And so for that reason, I don't carry around the story that, you know, that, that has made me cynical or, or jaded or anything like that. I, I carry around a story that when things get difficult in my life, I, I say to myself, is it really as difficult as being in the emergency room Christmas Day being told, you know, they can save your life? Probably not. So I think you can probably deal with this. 
Um, and, 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 you know, without getting into, you know, the stuff about my books and everything, reframing stories, I think is something that's really important so that they're empowering. Um, but when I got back, uh, we still had to do, well, there's so much that we had to do, but not the least of which was the All Valley Tournament. And I think that I tapped into that. He's nothing! He's nothing! And you're nothing! I own you! I own you, LaRusso! I was, I was angry. And I, I felt that I had been treated really poorly. And um, I was able to tap into that, which I think is, as actors, that's what we do. You know, you try and tap into real, organic emotion that's in your own life to bring to the characters you're playing. Um, and you asked I, me about, you asked me if, they, if it played into um, season five of Cobra Kai. Not at all. Um, it, it really didn't. Um, you know, you know, it's funny when I was playing the, the part where I finally got the opportunity to say all of this stuff that I wanted to say to Daniel for so long. I'm so sorry for the things that I said back in the day, the things that I did. Man, I have wanted to apologize to you so many times. In a weird way, it kind of mirrored the fact that, you know, when I, when I was doing Karate Kid 3, I mean, I was, a, I was a brash, cocky, yet still undisciplined kid. And that's kind of who everyone met. I, I was, I was a, a nice kid. I mean, I wasn't malicious or anything like that, but definitely not the guy that I am today. And so for me, I was really happy to have the opportunity to reconnect with Ralph as the guy that I am today, um, you know, rather than the guy that I was all those years ago. And, and that kind of played into the scene where I got to apologize to Daniel. Um, the stuff about, um, you know, uh, going to get Terry and, um, you know, all, all of that anger and all of that stuff. He fights for the legacy of Master Kim, for Cobra Kai. I don't give a shit what he fights for. I'm going to knock his ass out, and then you're next. You know, truthfully, anger is the easiest emotion to generate as an, as an actor. Um, um, it, it was just a lot of fun. It came naturally. For me, the stuff that was the, not the trickiest, but the stuff that I'm so happy it worked was the comedy stuff. You know, the stuff with Chosen, selling him the couch. I see you liking that tufted blue suede. Mmm, comfy. Mm. How much? Well, it's normally 1200 but what the hell? For you, two grand. The stuff with, uh, I mean, God, who knew Yuji Okamoto so funny, right? I mean, right. you know, I mean, he's yeah. just terrific. And I mean, you know, all of us together in that scene outside the limo, it, it just all kind of gelled at the same time, which doesn't always happen. Um, and we just had so much fun. I think you could see that. And, and you know, there really wasn't a whole lot that was difficult um, acting wise during that shoot. It just kind of flowed. Oh, absolutely. And I think we as an audience could easily see that. It just was such a pleasure to see all of you on screen together. And that makes absolute perfect sense. And you mentioned coming back and playing this as an actor, you know, who might be a little bit different than back in 1989. Sure. Did you sense working with everyone else and seeing everyone else again? Was everyone the same to you or did you sense that everyone else also is a little bit changed? Well, I never worked with, I never worked with Yuji and I never worked with Billy, although I, I've known Billy since probably 1987 and I've known Yuji a long time and interacted with him. Um, sure. Ralph certainly changed as, has changed because he's, you know, he's now a man. I mean, he's, you know, he's, uh, not that he wasn't then, but he's a, he's a guy that's 35 years down the road. And, you know, you've, you've had, you've had love, you've had loss and you've had tragedy and you've had victories. And it's like, you know, it's, it's like a tree that, that acquires those concentric rings and you become hopefully a uh, deeper, um, more thoughtful, more self-aware, interesting human being. Um, and that was one of the things that I, I, I wanted to see reflected with Mike Barnes. Like I said, I never worked with Yuji and, and Billy, but I'm huge fans of both of them. And they were just fantastic. You know, I, I've, I've waited so long to work with both of them. Um, and just, you know, one of the biggest problems I had in that scene is when Billy, Billy says, the bad boy's right. And I mean, just trying to keep a straight face. I like the way this guy thinks. Johnny! Oh, the bad boy's right, man. I mean, I was <laughs> I'm 56 years old. Here I am, still the bad boy. You know, but I love it. And it was just so, 
suddenly we're like a bunch of guys in high school just all fired up and and you know it, it was great it's interesting you brought up so many interesting things when you said that back in karate kid 3 you had that experience and that you weren't treated very well at the time yeah, yeah. did you find and now kind of extending that all the way through into your career was that experience did you find was that a common experience for you as an actor uh, working with all different crews on all different productions, or was that was that kind of a unique experience to Karate Kid Three? No, that was kind of singular. I mean, um, you know, I, I I worked on The Bold and the Beautiful since two thousand, and it's been one of the most amazing professional relationships I've ever had. You know, it's it's amazing to go to work in the entertainment business where you really feel valued. You feel that you've got uh, people. Um, in front of the camera and behind the camera that support what you do, people up in the office that support what you do. So, no, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think if I had to be really honest, and I'm just extrapolating here, you know, I think it was kind of a fear-based reaction. I mean, you know, they had hired a guy originally to play Mike Barnes, they fired him, right? Right then and there, that's horrendous for your production, right? Okay, so they get 2.0, they get me, and I was an unproven commodity. I mean, I was a very, very, very new actor. And I don't know that they were 100% sure. I don't know if they were 80% sure that I was going to pull it off. So they already were, you know, in a, in a state of at least, you know, not necessarily knowing how well this was going to go as, as the film continued. And now suddenly I get this life-threatening injury where they might lose a guy that they've now filmed for three weeks and production's starting to look like this could be a disaster. Do you know what I mean? So I, if I had to guess, I think a lot of the way I was treated came from initial fear from production. And I think they kind of forgot their humanity for a minute, but then, you know, they, they didn't even want to help pay my medical bills. So it wound up in a lawsuit. I, I had to, bring a workman's compensation suit against them. And I won $1,500. And it really was, it, it was, it, it was, it was pretty distasteful. You know, I mean, I, I went back to the set with a 15 inch wound on my abdomen that I have till this day. And I had, you know, all sorts of staples in my stomach. And I mean, you, know, you talk about blood, sweat and tears for, a project I, 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 there were all three and um you know i, I just think a, a, a little bit of humanity and compassion would have gone a long way but i didn't really experience a lot of that and you know what that might have been just the absolute best thing that could have happened for you know the rest of the film absolutely and and just so everyone who's watching it them might not be familiar with what happened this was an injury that took place when you were filming the scene in the dojo with Mr. Miyagi. Is that right? Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a really crazy thing I was doing. It had nothing to do with martial arts. I, I was supposed to stand in a, you know, just in a stationary position and then kind of jump about two feet and land on my side. And there were, there was no protective mat. There was, you know, um, you know, and I did it again and again and again. And they, just kept asking for takes and the cumulative effect of that was that it perforated my momentum, which I didn't even know you had an momentum or what it was, but apparently it sits on your lower intestine or upper intestine, something like that. And, um, we broke for Christmas, uh, and I was in Las Vegas Christmas day and I passed out from blood loss and went into shock and, uh, you know, uh, shit got real, real quick. And, um, um, my, my father flew out from Pennsylvania. He, they could only get one ticket. It was like, I think at midnight when my parents were told what was going on. And I can only imagine what that flight must have been like, you know, your kids in surgery, you don't really understand what's going on. You're not getting a lot of information. Um, and you know, I, I came to, and there was my dad sitting in a chair across from the bed and he just looked tired and gray. And, uh, you know, that, that was when I realized I, I made it through the surgery. And my next question was, you know, what's going on with the film? And I didn't have to wait too long as John Avildsen called. And I, you know, I, I knew, 
I knew what I was up against. And, um, um, you know, right then and there, uh, I decided to get out of bed and I could at least walk to the bathroom in the hospital in, in the room. And the next day, you know, around the, the nurse's station and everything. And within four days I had them release me against medical advice so that I could, you know, return to, uh, Los Angeles and, and try and save my, save my role. Because I mean, you know, imagine getting this role from an open call. I mean, you know, in, in reflecting back on it, I think it was a publicity stunt because I mean, are, you know, are you really going to trust finding one of the stars of the third installment of an international franchise to an open call of a bunch? Of, I mean, you should have seen a lot of the people who showed up. They weren't actors. I mean, you know, guys were showing up with in karate geese with weapons and I mean, just crazy. Right. I mean, and, and even though I was a very green actor, I was, you know, I was in the screen actors guild. I, I had just started acting class. I had done a few jobs. I was, you know, on the beginning path of being a professional actor. Um, and, you know, I don't know if you know this, Ken, I, I think I told you this, but I was doing this interview um, on the set of uh, Bold and Beautiful just before um, Cobra Kai dropped. And it was Entertainment Tonight. And I, I said, you know, this is so crazy, guys, because 35 years ago, I did an interview for Entertainment Tonight. And they said, well, we've got a really significant vault of past video, and we're going to find it. And they okay. found the exact moment when you see John Abelson pick me out of the line. And when I go in and do this interview with Entertainment Tonight and do some martial arts for them. So if anyone wants to see that, um, just Google Sean Kane and Entertainment Tonight. You want a little Ooh. demonstration yeah, a little of demonstration. what I can do? Yeah. Um, yeah, just a couple of kicks or something? Yeah. Sure. I hadn't seen that in 35 years. And, you know, sort of the seminal profound moments of our lives, I think we keep on a, you know, on a, a mental loop, you know, of how we remember it. But that memory is frequently refracted through a prism of a thousand variables. And when, when you really see what it looks like, it very rarely looks exactly like you think it does, right? But when I saw this, I was like, I was blown away at how, how much it mirrored what I remember it being like. And I think it's because it had such a profound effect on me. And it was really indelibly etched into my memory. But to actually see it, you know, there I am, 22 years old, my voice is higher, you know, I mean, I look like a kid. And it's just amazing to have a moment like that um, saved for posterity. Wow, that's that's really incredible. And so this, is, this was such a crazy experience and you went against medical advice, went back to the set after four days. What was that working relationship like at that point? Well, I, I didn't go back after, I didn't go back in for four days. I went back after a, probably about 10 or 11 days because uh, we were still on break. So when I got back, you know, people were like, hey, good to see you. We heard what happened. I mean, um, and they decided they were going to use a stuntman to, to do all the martial arts, which is, is a horrendous position to be put in. I mean, uh, that f for a production, not for me, but for, for them. So uh, they put me together with a guy that was a lineman for the Rams when the Rams were in uh, LA back in 89. And his name was Kyle Borland. And he trained me. And uh, we worked out at Dan Isaac's studio, which was a uh, uh, fitness studio, which was on the lot. And, you know, it was like day one I could do, you know, a handful of sit-ups and then 50 and then 100. And then, you know, I, I wound up doing all my own martial arts stunts in the film. Um, and, and for that reason, that's why the film was so special to me. But um, I was, you know, very concerned that I was going to reopen the wound. Um, and I, I always joke that it was probably a good thing that I wore a black gi at the final tournament because... Um, you know, it was bleeding on the inside. Wow. Oh my yeah. gosh. I can't even imagine that. What, how, yeah. how crazy is that? It was pretty crazy. Uh, and I'll, and I'll do even one better. So after that, I wound up doing um, a television show called the outsiders for Francis Ford Coppola yes. based on the books. And David Arquette was one of the guys in it. And he came up behind me and gave me this bear hug and just popped it open. And oh my God. this is never going to heal. And, uh, you know, it just, uh, it, it was something that was with me for, for 
quite a while. And, um, you know, now, you know, all this time later, you know, I look down, I look at the scar and, and to me, it's, it's not this unattractive scar anymore. It's kind of a, I don't know, I guess a badge of, of honor that, you know, it, it, it sure as hell beats the alternative. I'll put it that way. Right. And, you know, since then, you know, you've mentioned working on other projects, you've won an Emmy for Studio City, excellent series you created and executive produced. So you're now making these productions, you're in charge. I don't know if I would say in charge, I would say it's me and my wife and other partner, but they, they, they let me call a few shots. Okay. I'm like, I want turkey at craft service, damn it. <laughs> All right, get Katie turkey. <laughs> So let's say you have some sway now with, with these productions. Um, are there certain things you approach differently? You're looking at actors who are working on these productions. Um, are there things you remember from that Karate Kid 3 experience that you make sure that you're trying to correct maybe for a new generation? Um, oh, Ken, I could tell you, I could tell you some story. I mean, um, no, no, you know, I just had a flash of another horrendous story that, that happened to me. I, I, I don't know if I've ever even told this. Um, so, huh, okay. Um, so the first project I ever did was a, just a POS horror film. And it was between me and one other guy. And uh, they, they brought me and the other guy into a conference room. And there were, I don't know, five or six people there, men and women. And they said, wow, we, we have to make sure you don't have any tattoos. And they had both of us take all of our clothes off. And I will never forget how degrading and humiliating. And I just didn't, I didn't know any better. And so I literally stripped naked in front of these strangers. And so I, I produced a, uh, a film. Uh, it, was called, it was called Hack. And there was a scene in it where we had a, a girl who needed to be topless. And so I remember when we did the audition for that, um, I said, everybody's leaving the room. I'm leaving the room. It's going to be the director and we're going to leave, you know, one female with the director because I never wanted to make somebody feel the way that I felt that day. And it's funny to, to this day, I still think about that. And, and I think probably one of the things that's so upsetting about it was that I allowed it to happen, but I just didn't know any better. I, I don't know. I, anyway, um, but yeah, i i you know, I try to be very conscientious. I, I try to be conscientious of, of, of people's feelings just in general. I think that's probably a good way to be just to, you know, take into consideration other people's feelings to be compassionate. You know, um, you know, sometimes things get chaotic on a film and television set and people use, you know, verbal shorthand that can sometimes be a little curt, but I mean, if you do always remember that at the other side of those words are the ears of a human being and, um, you know, people remember how they're treated. And, um, I, I, I don't ever want somebody saying about me that I treated them in a way that, um, in any way eroded their dignity. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. And it also, um, makes me think of this book, that I received and read. It's called Way of the Cobra. Welcome to the Kumite. And yeah. for everyone who doesn't know, Sean, you are, you're an author and you actually have written entire books. This is the fourth one um, dedicated to helping people improve their lives, um, finding out what's keeping them stuck, uh, helping them reach yeah. their potential. And uh, this, this was like just incredible. I, read your first book, you know, when it came out and now I've read this book and I wanted to get your perspective on, you know, what, what is it that drives, you know, you talk about being nice to people, uh, you know, thinking about other people, but what is this, um, motivation that you have to, um, really help people, um, get them out of the rut they're stuck in and, you know, write these books, but also, you know, you do seminars and I was wondering yeah. if you could tell us a bit about that. You know, I, I genuinely like people, um, not all of them, but most of them. And, uh, you know, um, I think it's a little bit of that philosophy that, uh, you know, it's, it's, 
it's like love. The tighter you hold on to it, you know, you, you, you have to let it go. You have to circulate it. And, and I have learned a few things on the very bumpy, rocky road that I've traveled. And, you know, I talk about um, my struggles with alcohol and, and other issues uh, in the beginning of Welcome to the Kumite. And um, I, I figured a few things out. I, I knew that I had to kind of save myself. And I did. And I want to pass along some of that information to other people because I think it, at one point or another, everybody feels like they're on the precipice. You know, um, I can vividly remember times in my adult life where I didn't know if I was going to make it. I, not, not, you know, am I going to drop dead? But I, I didn't know if I was going to just slip into mediocrity and fade into oblivion or all of the, the, the grand ideas that I had about affecting the world and being the kind of human being that I wanted to be were going to come to fruition. And once I got out of my own way, um, it was like the heavens parted and um, my life became one blessing after the other. Um, and I want to pass some of that along. Well, you know, what's interesting about this is I know a lot of people watching this are fans of the Karate Kid or the Cobra yeah. Kai series. And this book is very unique because it's geared basically towards that. I mean, it's uh, each chapter is set up. It's like a belt and you're progressing. Mm -hmm. You're the sensei mm -hmm. um, and you have knowledge like you give practical knowledge from your own experience. You give all this theory, philosophy. You have all these exercises that you force the reader to go through. But it's really uh, I don't know. How, it's kind of like a kick in the ass. It is. A kick. I, I mean, so I just think it's so fascinating. What what is it about this book that you think especially would apply to fans of Cobra Kai and the Karate Kid? I know there's that martial arts aspect, but uh, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts? Well, I think it's the martial arts aspect. I mean, you know, the very best qualities of martial arts are courage and humility and compassion and, um, uh, you know, respect and all of those things. And those are things that I put a big value on. Um, I mean, I, I, I do I do make references here and there to kind of the Karate Kid, Cobra Kai world. This is not a book for fans of Karate Kid or Cobra Kai. If you are a fan of the Karate Kid films or Cobra Kai, you're probably going to enjoy it about 10% more. But this is, look, here's, here's the absolute truth of this. I was writing a self-help book prior to, um, prior to Way of the Cobra. And I just I had an epiphany. And I was like, you know, I can write this really great book that maybe 10 people are going to read, probably five of them are my, my family members. Or I'm part of this Karate Kid universe. Uh, Cobra Kai has become a juggernaut and there's this massive built-in um, fan base and way that I can kind of um, transmit this project to people. I would be silly not to do it. And so I basically retooled, you know, a lot of the same information and kind of cobraized it. But as I did that, other stuff started to open up. Like once I came up with the, the acronym for COBRA, which is Character, Optimization, Balance, Respect, and Abundance, it really sort of set my mind on a path that it started to be, take on a, a life of its own. And I, I, like, I like the concept of my readers are in the dojo because I think it's inclusive. It makes you feel that you're a part of this and, you know, that you're not alone. If you're somebody that's struggling, you know, we've all struggled. And, and I, I, I tell my readers, I said, yes, I'm your sensei, I'm your teacher, but so too are you my teachers. And that is so true. I have learned so much from the people that have read my book, and I've learned so much while I've written it. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very excited that the next book in the Way of the Cobra series is going to be written by the Queen Cobra herself and a, my wife, and it's going to be about relationships. So oh, wow. That, that ought to be interesting. Yeah, so I'm Absolutely. very excited. My, my wife's a brilliant writer. Uh, she's one of the head writers for Studio City. Um, and uh, it's going to be interesting to see her perspective because, you know, she put up with me for a lot of years when, you know, I wasn't exactly the shiny penny that I 
appear to be now. You know what I mean? <laughs> she's she's definitely on the short list for sainthood, um, but she 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 waited. She knew she knew what was there and waited until I knew what was there. And I think she's going to have some really interesting perspective um, to share with people who maybe are in relationships where, you know, they're, they're going through a rough time together. And, and you know, we've managed to keep a, a marriage together. We're going to have our uh, 11th anniversary uh, in July and in Hollywood. It's not the, not, thank you. And it's not the easiest place to be married if you allow it to be difficult. We don't. But um, I, I think we got a couple things that we can we can share, and it's not just about being married. I don't care if you're a gay couple or you're not married and you're living with whatever it is. Relationships, um, you know, they're they're sort of different animals in the same jungle. You know, there's certain rules that apply to everybody uh, that work, whether you're a, a traditional monogamous heterosexual relationship or you're you're not. Um, I just think there's certain things that probably are true no matter who you are. And uh, I'm really looking forward to writing this. Hey, you'll, you'll appreciate this, Ken. I, I just about got her to the place where I'm like, look, baby, I really think what we need to do is get one of those over-the-water bungalows like in Bora Bora and just just hunker down and write for a couple weeks, you know? <laughs> you know? Like, I, like I almost got her there, you know? She's like, do you have any idea how much that's going to cost? And I, I know, I know, but we'll make this sacrifice. Right? So. <laughs> that's well, that sounds exciting. That sounds great. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because, you know, that's kind of, you know, you talk about in the book about like the importance of like taking, just shutting everything off, like yeah. just taking a break, like to, to calibrate. And, uh, that's, that sounds like the best way to do it. I think, I think the two biggest, the two biggest lessons from welcome to the Kumite are this, the tagline is conquer your greatest opponent, which of course is yourself. Well, how do you do that? Well, you do that by emerging every day as a kinder, wiser, uh, yeah more self-aware individual than you were the day before. Okay. That's the first thing. The second major concept of the book is stay out of the results and concentrate on building a bulletproof process. You know, we use processes for all sorts of different things. Um, you know, people say, to me, how can you learn all those lines of the soap opera? And sometimes I have 30 pages of dialogue to learn. I do it because I have a process that I built to do it so that the night before I go film, I still don't know it all. I'm at about 88%, but I don't panic because I know that the process doesn't finish till I show up at the studio and rehearse with my other actors. And, and if you build a bulletproof process, it, it alleviates the anxiety, you know? And, and it, it, the best thing I can equate it to is you know, you and I probably do 99.9% .9 the same thing when we drive a car. You know, you unlock your car, you sit down, you put the seatbelt on, you check your mirrors, you put the nav in, you back up, check your mirrors, you go. You don't, you don't, and you obey the street signs. You don't think, oh my God, am I going to get there? Am I going to get there? You expect to get there if you do everything right. And, and we use these processes for, for so many different things. And if you concentrate on just building a bulletproof process and then continually doing a diagnostic to make sure that, you know, there's nothing that you can improve or change. You'll get results. They may not be exactly what you envision them being, but with rare exception and, and discounting, you know, uh, a horrendous breaking fastball to the head that like does throw us sometimes you're going to get what you want accomplished. And that's, really had a profound effect on my life. You know, as, as actors, you know, 98 times out of 100, when I audition for something, I don't get it. And if I looked at that as a failure every single time, I would never be able to set foot into another casting office. But if I look at it like, okay, my job is to do a performance for these people right here, right now. It's out of my control whether they hire me. And I know what I have to do to prep for it. I know what I have to do to do it. And then I know what I have to do to let it go. And if I do that enough over the arc of time, I'm going to get the results I want. And also it allows me to derive benefit from the process, even when it doesn't give me the result right then and there. You know, maybe I got to audition for a casting director who didn't know me. You know, maybe I got to prepare a role that's outside of my wheelhouse. 
you know, um, you know, maybe I got to stop and help somebody, um, you know, jump their car who, unbeknownst to me, was a doctor who was late to go to the hospital. Who the hell knows, right? So I have gotten better and better, although I'm not perfect, even though I wrote the book. It's staying out of the results. So you have this great book and you also ha offer opportunities for people to hear from you in person doing seminars and can yeah. you explain about like the other avenues people can learn yeah i, I love doing my seminars i i love my uh private coaching practice it, it just it gives me so much joy and pleasure to work with people and to inspire them and to help them and to you know get them to assume responsibility for their their lives and some of the unbelievable effects and, and turnarounds that I've seen people accomplish, boy, it just, uh, you know, it, it just feels so good. Um, you know, whether it's, it's somebody that, you know, has lost a lot of weight, which I completely understand because I've lost almost 50 pounds. Um, whether it's somebody who finally gets that relationship that they deserve instead of settling for repeating that same loop over and over again and wondering why it's not working. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I have four different seminars that I'm currently, uh, offering two of them are based on the way the Cobra welcome to the Kumite books. And two of them are based on, uh, on acting. And, uh, if anyone would like to uh, learn more, just go on my Instagram page. It's Sean.Kanan, or you can go to Sean.actor and, uh, you know, it, it, it has just made me a better guy, um, you know, working with people. And it's so funny. You know, I used to say years ago, I used to have this, I don't know why I said it, but I used to say over time, I'd say, hey, look, I'm, I'm nobody's role model. It's not my job to be a role model. And I think that's because secretly I knew that I wasn't living the life that I was meant to live. And that was kind of a cop out. And I, I, I guess begrudgingly, <laughs> Um, or, or, you know, kicking and screaming, I, I have come to the point where I realize that I, I, I do have a responsibility. And, um, you know, if, if that's something that anybody wants to bestow upon me as the title of role model, then I will graciously accept it and do my best to um, humbly live, live up to it. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, everyone go check out Sean's Instagram and then wayofthecobra.com if you're interested in the books. Uh, yeah. You can go there to get the books. Now, Sean, yeah. I need to, uh, before we close out today, of course, I have to ask, is there anything at all generally, your thoughts, hopes, teases for a Cobra Kai season six? Well, I mean, look, I, I, I certainly can't comment on any of it. And, and first of all, we are all desperately hoping that this writer's strike ends soon and hoping that there isn't an actor's strike. So, you know, I'm, I'm dubious about whether we're going to avoid that. Um, you know, the only thing I can say is that, um, uh, you know, Mike Barnes has got a burned down furniture store. He's got a Rembrandt probably worth about $60 million. He's got three new friends and, um, you know, he's a 10th degree black belt and a national champion. And, Boy, I bet he would make a pretty good sensei to help uh, guide the kids into how to best win a tournament. So um, <laughs> all I can say wow. is keep the faith and we shall see. And I got to say one more thing. I, and I, I, I totally attribute this to my wife. And I attribute it to the amazing new AI technology that's out there. Although that may prove not to age well as, as we get down the line. Um, uh, Way of the Cobra is going to be available in Italian, French, and Spanish, um, it most likely is going to be finished later today. And about as quickly as my wife is able to upload it to Amazon, uh, you'll be able to get it in all those languages. And um, I I'm so excited about it. And then the next thing that we're going to jump into is getting the audio books done. Um, you can get Way of the Cobra on Amazon. If you'd like to get uh, an autographed and personalized copy of either of the books, please hit me up on, uh, on wayofthecobra.com. Wow. That's, that's fantastic, Sean. I know so many people are going to be checking that out. We're looking forward to seeing you in all kinds of new projects going forward. Cobra Kai season six, of course, as well. And, um, thanks for joining us today. And Sean, we'd love to have you back as, uh, as things progress and more news pops up. Absolutely. Ken, you know what? I, I just, 
from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for what you do, not only for the fans, but for what you do for us. I mean, you know, it, it's amazing to think that a role I played 35 years ago still has relevance and you are an absolute part of that. And um, I, I just really appreciate you and I will come back anytime you'll have me. Well, well, thank you so much, Sean. It's, you know, it's amazing and it's an honor covering uh, this show and these movies. And of course, uh, Mike Barnes is a, uh, and Sean Kanan is a huge part of so many uh, people's lives growing up and uh, it's, it's an honor. So thank you so much for thanks. saying that, Sean. I really appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, pal. And thanks to everybody who's watching. I'll see you around. All right. Okay. See you, Sean. Take care, take care buddy.